My name is Chris, though you might recognize my voice from another channel called Stohove, where I do various tutorial videos for Fantasy Grounds Unity. In this collaboration with Smiteworks, I will be walking you through the Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Monsters of the Multiverse Supplement Module from a player's point of view. The Monsters of the Multiverse supplement was initially released during the holiday season of 2021, although it was slightly delayed, into 2022, and in May of 2022 as an individual book, and it brings forward a number of player races that were introduced in older supplements to the current state of 5th edition, or at least at the time of this recording. These modules were Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes and Volo's Guide to Everything. However, in both, it was not a full merger, quote-unquote, of the resources that those modules provided. However, this module does bring forward all of the elements players used quite regularly and essentially eliminated a few things that players never really dealt with that often. As a player, this is going to be important because there's a chance you might be playing with a character whose race was pulled from either of those older modules. I will be sure to provide a few examples of what to look for because it's going to be relevant to a conversation you might want to have with your dungeon master about the current state of your character versus potentially changing them and linking them against the new races associated with Monsters of the Multiverse. Before we get into that, however, there's one more thing I want to point out about the changes you might notice, and that is that a large number of extraneous random roll tables were removed, eliminating some of the customizations that used to exist for a given player character. But this is a good thing, and I will go into why I think that is when we look at that section. As there is a player and a Dungeon Master's version of the Fantasy Grounds Unity module, I'm going to record two separate videos. One, which is for the players, which is this one, and another for the Dungeon Master. This way, as a player, I can bring you up to speed with the contents and changes of this module and not spoil much in the way of information that might relate to other changes that a Dungeon Master might want to surprise you as a player with during a given campaign. However, I will include a link to that video in the description below. As a player, you will not need to purchase this module as it will be downloaded to your Fantasy Ground session at the time that your system connects to the Dungeon Master session. However, if it is a module you would like to see used within your Dungeon Master's campaign and they don't currently own it, then I would strongly encourage you to help them pick it up as it will allow them to contribute that module back to the rest of your group. Of course, that assumes that you are a group that shares those costs. If not, the Dungeon Master might have already just decided to pick it up for you. If, however, you would like to see where you can get that module, I highly recommend that you take a look at the first couple of sections of the Dungeon Master's version of this video, as I've already gone through the process of explaining where that comes from. When you connect to a Dungeon Master session, their system is going to transfer a temporary copy of the player's version of the module over to your client, even though it might not necessarily be loaded on your client just yet. That process will be completed almost immediately after you have finished authenticating to their session. And thus, you will have two options available to you in order to be able to load the module. The first option will come into play when you initially connect to a Dungeon Master session for the very first time, or if you have not disabled the ability for this window to load each time you connect, you will see this campaign setup window. And all you have to do is click the next button. This module is not considered a core rule set. As such, you will want to click on the All Rules button in order to be able to load all of the player versions of the modules that the Dungeon Master is serving out. And it will be restricted to those modules that the Dungeon Master will allow someone to load. So, for example, you can see here that I am not permitting Bolo's Guide to Monsters to be loaded on your client. However, it will load the potentially conflicting modules. Although you will need those modules loaded if you still have a character linked to them. There are no issues if you do happen to have both modules alongside one another, you'll just see duplication within the various panels that you might be looking through. The second option that is available to you is directly from the module activation panel. And you can see here that all you have to do is narrow down your search. So I'm narrowing it down to just those modules provided by Wizards of the Coast. And then I'm simply going to look for multi and simply load up that module. And this is in case you have all of the other modules already loaded and you don't want to take the risk of having all of those reset. It's also sometimes just as quick to go in and select modules, activation, and search for the one that you're looking for, and then click load on that particular book.
As I've already mentioned, Mordenkainen's Monsters of the Multiverse has a mixture of player and non-player content broken up into segmented modules. This means that as a player, you would only be able to make use of the player's module. And within that module, you will find a few items that you will be able to use in order to go through and create new characters, such as new character races and a couple of sub-races. The contents that you will find are as follows. The races panel is going to show you the available races that you now have in order to be able to create a character. And some of these will be aligned with those from the original source materials. However, there are some changes that we will get to a little bit later on in the video. The images panel is able to show you all of the images associated with the character races that you can choose from. It also contains some of the artwork that is included, specifically in this case, the cover for the book, because that is loaded as part of the reference material here. Sorry, the reference manual here. You can see that here. So anything that is required to be displayed in these sections here will be loaded within this images panel. And the final panel that actually contains any content is going to be the tables panel. And this has a far reduced listing of all of the tables that you can make use of to customize your character. If anyone loads up any of the older supplements, you'll see a much larger list of tables here. And in this particular case, this module reduces it to four. All of these panels are accessible from the campaign and the character sub menus here. And they're fairly quickly, easily accessible. All you have to do is expand out that option and click on whether it's the oops, images or even the table section here when it comes to those under the campaign section or when it comes to the races underneath the character section. Mordenkainen's Monsters of the Multiverse makes significant changes with respect to the various races that were introduced by the older modules. The first and foremost is that all of those races have been expanded out into a total of 30 races and three sub-races that were modernized to match the current state of how D&D is expected to be used from a player's point of view. In addition to that, some of the sub-races from the other modules have actually been created as actual races here. So you can see, for example, that the Deep Gnome race has been listed here, whereas in the other module it used to be a sub-race of the gnomes. This should make it easier to understand the unique characteristics of those playable creatures and allow you to more quickly decide on what you would like to choose for a character, specifically what race you would like to select. Additionally, this module continues to provide choices in that process with the addition of a couple of new player races that you can now select. However, I'm going to leave you the fun of trying to figure out which ones they are, just so that I don't spoil anything for you. Some of the other things that you will notice is that, as I exposed with the gnome, there are going to be a couple of different races that are available with the new module. So the Githyanki and the Githzeri here are what you will get out of Monsters of the Multiverse. Whereas with Tome of Foes, it was just the Gith. And these two were part of the sub-race associated with that Gith. Other changes that you will find is that their creature type, size, and speed might remain the same, but some of the traits that are going to be introduced by these characters are now going to be different. Whether it's the same thing simply reworded and slightly adjusted or completely new, that's going to be dependent on the individual race. And this is one of the things that you will want to keep your eyes open for with respect to the wording. And that is because some of these traits are now a little bit more favorable to you as a player. They also add clarity to a lot of those particular traits that were a little bit confusing. So if you get a chance, I highly recommend that you look into converting your character and I will demonstrate that later on in the video. When it comes to the images panel, these images are all going to be linked directly from the reference manual itself. So if you look here and you pop open the reference manual, any page that had an image associated with it in the book is also going to have that associated here in the reference manual. But you'll also be able to access them directly from the images listing here. You can also access them directly from the race itself that you might be playing. So if you click on Asimar here, for example, you will see that there is an image icon here at the top. If you click that, that will pop open the image. So if I scroll up here and take a look at this, it's going to be the same image. That's why it didn't open it up a second time. And this is one of the few modules that actually preloads a lot of the images that you as a player are meant to see directly in the player's module, whereas in the past it used to be shared over directly from the Dungeon Master session. And lastly, before we look at converting a character, is the tables panel. 
This table panel is where you're going to find the biggest set of changes with respect to you as a player, because a huge portion of the character customization tables that were introduced by the original source material is gone. In fact, only four made it into this particular module, specifically these four here. And they made a lot of sense to include them because they relate directly to the process of creating your character. The remaining character customization tables were simply dropped, and at this point the only way that you can access them again is if the Dungeon Master has chosen to keep the older modules loaded. However, in my years as a Dungeon Master, I have actually never really seen a player go into that much depth with respect to creating characters, so it made a lot of sense for those tables to just simply go away. Each of these tables are accessible through the various races where they are meant to be used from. So for instance, the Fey Characteristics table is going to be accessible here in the Fairy listing, whereas the Lycanthrope Ancestor table here is going to be listed under the Shifter one. And that is because they relate directly to going through the process of creating those characters. But however you choose to use and access those tables should be fairly straightforward and simple, so it should be quite quick to get to them if you need them. Before I conclude the video, I want to show you an example of how to convert your character. So I've gone ahead and created a character here that comes from Tome of Foes. Specifically, what you will see is that I have a gnome-based character here who has the Deep Gnome subrace. And I want to be able to convert this particular character to using those provided by Monsters of the Multiverse. And this is something new, in case you hadn't observed, is that both the race and the subrace are now linked as separate icons here with respect to any character that happens to have a subrace. I'm not entirely certain when it got introduced, but I've only recently started seeing it, so it couldn't have been that far back. This is only going to be possible if your Dungeon Master had Volo's Guide to Monsters or Tome of Foes, or both of them, loaded and allowed you to create your character using one of those playable races introduced by those modules. It's possible the DM is going to want to encourage you to convert your character, because they might want to remove those older modules and remove some of the complexity that they introduce. However, that's only going to be possible if they themselves are not using any of the creatures and have not yet converted those creatures over to the newer versions of the module. There are a couple of things that I want to point out. The first is that you're going to want to make note of the stats here. Even though there are a couple of options that you can use to convert your character, you could, for example, create a brand new character and then copy everything over, but when you create that character, you select the new race, that's perfectly legitimate and fairly straightforward to do. What I'm going to do, though, is show you how to convert your character in place, meaning that you're not going to have to go through the process of creating a brand new character to do that. When we do that, you're going to want to ensure that you update the race here. If you don't do that, you'll still have references to the old modules that are going to break every single time you try to click on one of these options or icons. So let me go ahead and bring up the Deep Gnome information sheet. And this will be from Monsters of the Multiverse. So I'm going to set that there for the time being. You are also going to want to take note of which saving throws you have proficiencies in and make sure that their bonuses don't change in this process. I don't think it will actually happen, but I wasn't entirely certain on the couple of tests that I did whether those got changed or not. Something seemed different here and I couldn't quite put my fingers on it. So it's something that you're just simply going to want to make note of just in case something happens. And finally, this one might become unimportant with respect to the languages because with the new character trait here, you don't gain as many languages as you used to with respect to the older characters. You gained one when you selected your race here, and then sometimes you gained an additional one. You can see that here, extra language, whenever you created a character with a subrace. However, if your dungeon master is being a stickler around removing those extra languages, all you'll want to do is simply edit list and then remove by double clicking on this red circle here, you'll want to remove the language that you just simply want to remove from your character. I'm not going to do that here because I don't need to in this particular case. And before you go ahead and actually begin the process of replacing this, you're going to want to double check to make sure that the race you're converting into is either a sub race associated with the original race. So in this case, it was the gnome and I'm converting this deep gnome into this deep gnome. However, there are still some subraces with respect to Monsters of the Multiverse, so you might end up keeping that same process here. In our case, Deep Gnome is now a full-blown race with respect to this particular change, so we're going to lose an icon here because it's now going to go directly to here. So let me close out these two older information panels. This is going to become our new reference guide. 
And to start the conversion process, I'm simply going to drop this into place and you will see that it's going to clear that out. I am then going to make sure that nothing got changed here. So in this particular case, we had 15, 15, 13, 14, 10, and 8. Good. Nothing got changed there. We also did not see a change with respect to our saving throws, our proficiencies, our skills would not have changed, and the only thing that really does change is going to be the traits because it's now a much larger list. There was, however, one change in case you caught it with respect to the senses. Superior dark vision is now just simply replaced with dark vision. I do believe superior dark vision is going away. So we want to make sure that we delete that. And that way our character only really has one reference to dark vision and it isn't going to screw up fantasy grounds when our character is added to a map. I'm then going to go back to the abilities tab here and I'm going to look specifically for the two traits that were originally there. So I'm going to go ahead and remove Gnome Cunning and Stone Camouflage. And that's because this, and I believe it is, I don't want to delete it, Gift of these, I've never been able to pronounce that. I'm pretty certain it's these two that are now replacing the original stats. So Gnome Cunning had a little bit of a change. In fact, it this is primarily where Gnome Cunning came into play, but this is also something that is now coming into play with respect to that. And then the Camouflage one literally got changed into this one. And I'm intentionally not saying this name because I really don't want to make a fool of myself on trying to pronounce that. <laughs> And to confirm that, what you'll want to do is languages is one of the few things that's actually not displayed on this information sheet. You'll just simply want to click other and then take a look at the languages that your character will know and then remove those that don't make sense to be there anymore. And then the last thing you're going to want to do is take a look through the information sheets here and determine if there's anything that you really should add to your character's action sheet in order to ensure that you have access to them in the combat tracker, whatever effects that they're going to give your character. For instance, here we have advantage on intelligence, wisdom, and charisma saving throws when spells come into play. And while there really isn't a default way to determine whether a particular incoming attack is a spell, you could theoretically apply the effect so that you can add it to your character quickly, and then it will just simply set up and go away. The other option is to go ahead and just simply click this ADV button down here at the bottom. In this particular case, I'm advocating just simply using this. Although if you have extensions that enable the functionality of this particular trait here, then I highly recommend you simply use those extensions to add that feature to your character's action sheet or your trait, I should say. And just to give you an example of what an effect might look like, instead of going down here and clicking on the ADV button, I've just simply created a Gnomish Magic Resistance effect, ADV save, and then Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma, set it up for self, and on next roll. That way, if you ever do have to quickly add it, you can just simply click this, it gets added to your character, the incoming saving throw is rolled against your character, and then it just drops away. This one, however, does require a bit of change in respect to how it should work here on the character's action sheet. And that is because you do have a dexterity specific stealth check here that you can gain advantage of, but you can only use this a number of times. That means that it needs to be tracked. So that is set up much like this. Again, just the name of the trait, ADV check, colon, stealth, and there's a semicolon here just for clarity. And then finally, it's going to be on your character. And once again, it's going to expire on the next roll. And the reason why I've done that is this is something that does require a bit of change out. So our proficiency bonus is plus two. That means that we can only use this twice per day with respect to all expended uses. So that means that our character would have to rest at least once after the expenditure of both of these options or uses here before they would regain those effects. That's the reason why it's set up that way. And this one here, we don't really need to do anything just yet. Our character is only first level. And this one here, where we get to cast Disguise Self on our character, starts at third level. And at fifth level, we gain the non-detection spell, the ability to use that without using any material components. This is simply a use of this particular trait to be able to cast that spell. However, there will be a use limitation that we'll also want to add to this once we get there. So we'll want to be sure that we go ahead and create that when our character is level three. I'm not going to worry about doing that in this particular video. I have other videos that 
set up things very similar to this on my own channel that you can take a look at and use those for reference. And the main purpose of this demonstration was really just how do you convert your character. But that's as complicated as it is. You just got to make note of a couple of things, set up any of your new traits here, and make sure you remove the old traits from this particular list. You'll see a slightly longer list if your character didn't have something listed like the creature type or some of the other effects that came into play when you originally created your character. And because the new book is standardizing a lot of this, this all gets added into your character. As you can see, Monsters of the Multiverse has a huge impact on the choices as you as a player can now make. But while a large portion of that is the loss of some functionality, specifically around customizations, in the end, I still feel it is better for the game. It optimizes the whole process of creating a character and no longer buries you in the details that might not necessarily be important to you with respect to your character. And that choice has always been and always will be about the customization of your character, and that really should be left with you. The older methods tried to control that process in some way, and because of that, pretty much no one used them. However, I want to thank you for watching this video on behalf of Smiteworks and myself. I also want to thank Smiteworks for providing me with the opportunity to present this information on their channel, and I look forward to continuing with our collaboration. Please click on the like button if you found the information in this video useful to helping you understand and learn how to use Fantasy Grounds Unity specific to this module, and consider subscribing to the Smiteworks Fantasy Grounds YouTube channel to keep up to date with new content as it is released. If you have any questions or comments about this video, feel free to post them in the comment section below so that others can see them and can contribute to the discussion.